I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you. I will extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another and they will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Let us pray. Abba Father, we come as the psalmist did to sing praises to your holy name. We come to sing of your mighty works, to sing of the creation that you have made and placed us within, to sing of our very lives, to sing of your Son, the Lord Jesus, to sing of how he came and lived and died and rose again so that we could be known as your people now and forever. We thank you for all the things that make up our lives. We thank you for all the little things and all the big things. We thank you that you are concerned with the big decisions we have to make and the big things we face but you also are mindful of every hair that rests upon our head and all the wee things that are around us. Coming to you then, our almighty yet intimate and loving God, we know we can be honest before you about our brokenness and our fear, about our sin and our doubt, about the aspects of our lives that we wish were different, the things in our lives that we have made the way they are because of our sin and because of our fallenness and the things that are around us that have happened that we have had no control over. So we present to you all of that, all at once. We ask for forgiveness for our sins and we ask that you would help us and lead us and guide us in your ways so that that song of the psalmist would be ours that we, could, by remembering once again who you are, could truly celebrate that together. We show that desire. We share that desire as we pray together the words of that family prayer given to us by your Son, as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen as we come to sing once again to the praise of our God, we come with the words of 557, Fight the Good Fight, number 557.
Boys and girls, if you'd like to come and meet me at the front, I'll see you there. Can you see okay down there, or do you want to budge up a wee bit? Well, we'll budge up a wee bit, budge up a wee bit, squidge up a wee bit. That's better, isn't it? Brilliant. I, I don't think. No. They did go, didn't they? Yeah. Oh, here they come now. See the heads. Do you want to jump in there, maybe? And then you could see a bit better. Jump in there. Just there, in there, in there. That's brilliant, that's brilliant. Well, good morning. Now, you now come on. Good morning. And it is a good morning because we're here together to worship God and to learn more about what it means to follow Jesus. And because of that, I've brought something to show you. So, does anybody have any of these at home? The Mr. Men books and the Little Miss books, yes. Now, I brought some with me because what I wanted to think about today was imagine when you're all growing up and you're about to start a new job and you go in and you meet your boss okay and you come home and whoever's at home with you says what's your new boss like and you start to tell them what your new boss is like you say well she's this high and she has this long hair or he's this small and he has no 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 I don't want to know what your boss looks like what's he like is he nice is she nice is he not nice? What's he like? And you have to start thinking about, well, he seemed okay to me. He was polite. He was funny. Uh, she was kind. Or she was a wee bit mean. Or whatever. Okay, you have to think about what the person is like. And in the Mr. Men books, we have a little book that tells us all about someone. And it gives us a clue on the front of the book what the Mr. Man or the Little Miss is going to be like. So, does anybody know why Mr. Forgetful is called Mr. Forgetful? Because he's forgetful. Mr. Forgetful really struggles to remember anything. And that's why he's called Mr. Forgetful. Now what's next? Mr. Slow. Why is Mr. Slow called Mr. Slow? Because he's slow and he does everything slowly and takes forever to do everything. Okay. What about Mr. Worry? Why is Mr. Worry called Mr. Worry? Yeah? Because he worries all the time. He worries about everything. He worries about absolutely everything. What shoes he's going to put on, where he's going to go. Is he going to be late? If he gets there, is he going to be in the right place? What's his food going to be like? Is anybody going to talk to him? And he worries. And then when he gets home in time, will he get enough sleep tonight? And he worries 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 and he worries. And, he worries. and that's why he's called Mr. Worry. Little Miss Giggles. Well, she giggles all the time, even when she shouldn't. She laughs. You know the times when it's really serious? She laughs. Giggles all the time. You get the idea. Mr. Chatterbox doesn't stop talking. Talks all the time, all the time, all the time. Talks, 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 talks. Mr. Silly. Well, he's always silly. Even when it's time to be serious and sensible. He's a bit like little Miss Giggles, isn't he? When it's time to be serious and sensible, he's silly. Mr. Noisy. Well, no, I think we get the idea, don't we? Mr. Noisy's noisy because he's always loud, even when you're meant to be quiet. He's really loud. And there he is playing his drums. And then I think the last one I've got is Mr. Greedy. Now, why is Mr. Greedy called Mr. Greedy? Because he's always greedy. He'll not eat one sandwich, he'll eat 12 sandwiches. He'll not just want dinner, he'll want two dinners. And he'll eat and he'll eat and he'll eat and he's always eating. So the thing is, what I wanted to think about just for a wee minute with you all these people are known by what they do. It's not right. Mr. Greedy is known as Mr. Greedy because he's always eaten. Mr. Forgetful is known as Mr. Forgetful because he always forgets things. And in the Bible, we do hear this wee verse from the Bible, in the big Bible today, uh, this time from Matthew. Now, is Matthew in the New Testament or the Old Testament? Who is, it? is it in the Old Testament? Who thinks it's in the Old Testament? Who thinks it's in the New Testament? And who doesn't know? 
So it's in the New Testament, because remember, it's a story written by a friend of Jesus. And this is what it says. Watch out for the false prophets. They will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they would be like wolves. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? By their fruits you will know them. Now all that means is I want you to imagine a big tree with lots of nice fruit on it. It's a nice tree, isn't it? Would you rather go and pick something from that tree? Or would you rather go and pick something from a tree that had prickles and thorns and nettles on it? You would go to the nice tree with the fruit. And what the Bible is asking us to do is to think about what do people think when they are asked what you're like? Do they say, oh, she's very kind, or she's very sweet and helpful, and she always does the right thing, and she loves Jesus very much? It's not a nice thing for people to say about us, but people will only say those things about us if we do those things. If we are the tree with the nice fruit that are kind and thoughtful and love Jesus and try to do all the things that the Bible asks us to do, then that's what people will say about us when they're asked, what's he like or what's she like? And that is the challenge that the Bible gives us, that with God's help, with the help of Jesus, we can be those people who people would say that about. So, is that something to think about? Will we pray? Will we talk to God? Let's pray. Father, help us to be the tree with the nice fruit, the tree that is a person who loves you and who always tries to do the right thing, tries to be kind and tries to help other people see Jesus by the way we live our lives. Help us to be that person that other people would say nice things about and good things about so that we, bit by bit and through your strength, can make the world a wee bit better day by day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So uh, we're going to stand and we're going to sing together number 498. Do no sinful action. And then after that, you can head out the kids. So, all right. Thank you very much. Good morning. May I warmly welcome you in the Saviour's name to our service on this day that the Lord has made. Just like to uh, make some announcements and you'll find them there on the news sheet. As we 
gather this, the, this morning for our worship. We begin a new series looking at the story of Balak and Balaam from the book of Numbers. If that's unfamiliar to you, that story, hopefully by the end of our little series, it won't be, and you'll see the gems and the jewels there are for us to find in that story. Um, so this evening when we gather together again for the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, uh, we'll carry on uh, with that, the next part of that series this evening, working through it over the month of July. So you're very much invited back uh, tonight uh, for that time of service on celebration and um, observance of the Lord's Supper. After that service, as is custom with communion services, there is a retiring offering for the Benevolent Fund. The coffee bar is open for all after the service this morning, and everyone is welcome to stay for that time of uh, refreshment and fellowship together. After the service this evening, um, we will have our quite reduced annual general meeting, and that will take place directly after the service tonight, and will focus mainly on financial issues, and uh, all are asked to stay for that if possible. Uh, Morning Watch will meet on Tuesday at quarter to 11 in the session room and again all are very welcome to that time of of intercessory prayer and fellowship. Uh, The walking group will take place on Saturday leaving the church at 9.30am for a walk at Newry Canal. If you need any more information about that please don't hesitate to speak uh, to Robert. Uh, Next Lord's Day we gather at the normal time of 11am as we continue on the series that I've just spoken of. Uh, The other big announcement I'd like to highlight is the information regarding the Holiday Bible Club, which we're delighted that will be back up and running after um, an absence due to COVID and one thing and another. So all the information is there, and I would really encourage you to spread the word about it um, and to encourage uh, primary school children and the families of primary school children uh, about that uh, Holiday Bible Club taking place from the 15th to the 20th of August. Uh, On the back of the due sheet, there's some uh, information regarding requests for help. If anyone would be able to assist with either open church or creche, uh, please please do, even if you can only do it occasionally. uh, Every little helps. Uh, So if you would be interested in either helping uh, with open church or creche, please have a wee look at the information there. The last uh, announcement I'd like to highlight is the announcement regarding the Malawi trip that we've been talking about over the last number of weeks. We're getting to the position now where we really need to start booking things and making some firm plans and arrangements for that. Uh, So if you are interested in being part of the team that will go to Malawi from the church uh, next summer, uh, please do uh, pop into the session room after the service today for a very short meeting um, and we'll begin to put more preparations in place. If you know of someone who's not here today, who has expressed an interest and would very much like to come, if you would get them to speak to either myself or Sheena as soon as possible, that will be helpful uh, so we can put everything together. I'd like also to just ask you to remember Stuart Barber as he is well on his way to completing his walk of over 400 miles, uh, pretty much from the top to the bottom of Ireland. Um, And I don't know if any of you on social media or Facebook or whatever have been keeping up to date with Stuart and the photographs of the many people he has met along the way. Um, So we want to continue to pray for Stuart as he raises money uh, for cancer focus um, by doing in Stuart Barber style in quite an outlandish way. Uh, So we want to remember him for that and we look forward to hearing his story uh, about it upon his return. So there are all our announcements and we come now to the Word of God and our first reading today comes from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, his second letter, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and if you would like to read along with me you'll find it on page 1146 of the Pew Bible, that's 1146. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, this is the Word of God. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, 
I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of the world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and with every position that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. You are looking only on the surface of things. If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, he should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as he. For even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord give us from building you up rather than pulling you down, I will not be ashamed of it. I do not want to seem to be trying to frighten you with my letters. For some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. Such people should realize that what we are in our letters when we are absent, we will be in our actions when we are present. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits but will confine our boasting to the field God has assigned to us, a field that reaches even to you. We are not going too far in our boasting, as would be the case if we had not come to you, for we did get as far as you with the gospel of Christ. Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others. Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our area of activity among you will greatly expand so that we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. For we do not want to boast about work already done in another man's territory. But let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Amen. And we thank God for his word.
Our second reading from the Word of God is from the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 22, and you'll find that on page 160 of the Pew Bible, beginning the story of Balak and Balaam. Numbers chapter 22, starting at the first verse. Then the Israelites travelled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, son of Sippor, saw that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, this horde is going to lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to summon Balaam, son of Beor, who was at Pethor, near the river in his native land. Balak said, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the country. For I know that those you bless are blessed and those you curse are cursed. The elders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them the fee for divination. When they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. Spend the night here, Balaam said to them, and I will bring you back the answer the Lord gives me. So the Moabite princes stayed with him. God came to Balaam and asked, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Sippor, king of Moab, sent me this message. A people that has come out of Egypt covers the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I will be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You must not put a curse on these people because they are blessed. The next morning Balaam got up and said to Balak's princes, Go back to your own country, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the Moabite princes returned to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak sent other princes more numerous and more distinguished than the first. They came to Balaam and said, This is what Balak, son of Zippor, says. Do not let anything keep you from coming to me, because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you say. Come and put a curse on these people for me. But Balaam answered them, even if Balak gave me his palace filled with silver and gold, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. Now stay here tonight, as the others did, and I will find out what else the Lord will tell me. That night God came to Balaam and said, Since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. Amen. And once again. We thank God for his word. Before we sing again, let's take some time to pray, praying for the world and for the church in a time of intercessory prayer. Let's pray. Father, it is good to be still and to pray together. It is good to be able to come and to lift to you whatever is in our hearts just now. We come out of the world of which we are a part, a world with many troubles and concerns, a world with many blessings too. But in these moments, we want to lift to you those who need your help and those who need your guidance and those who need to experience more and more of your grace. We thank you for this little place that we call home, and we are mindful of many people who have come from 
countries far away and have found themselves among us here in this place. We pray for them, whoever they are, and for uh, the circumstances that got them here. We lift them to you. And we ask, Father, that they would know your help and their strength as they try and make a life in a very different place. We pray for those who miss their families and those who feel very far away from their home. We pray for the countries for, from which they have come. We think of places like Afghanistan and Yemen. We think especially of Ukraine, so many other places that know war and strife and know that ugly side of what makes us human. We pray, Father, for all of those in authority and in power. And we ask that you, by the work of your Holy Spirit, would be moving in among the most unlikely of people in the most unlikely of places, bringing your kingdom into the middle of war and darkness and ugliness. As we pray for that wide world, we pray for your church as she seeks to be faithful to you in this world in war-torn places, in places of poverty, in places of political corruption, in places of, of indifference, in places of persecution. And in all of those unique contexts, we pray that our brothers and sisters would be strengthened and guided by their Lord and Shepherd, Jesus Christ. They would have no strength and courage to continue in their faithful service of you. As we pray for the world, Father, we pray for the people that make up our daily lives in our little worlds that surround us. And we pray that whatever is in our hearts today, we could bring it humbly before you. We could bring our grief and our mourning. We could bring our burdens, our fears. We could bring the people whom we love who are hurting. We could bring whatever it is and present it to you and hear the words that you whisper to us, words of promise, words of hope, and words of joy. That you promise to never leave us or forsake us, that your love for us is sure, and that you will bring together all things for good for those who serve you. Words of grace and hope that help us to remember that within our hearts there is a new and better thing than the world. And that is Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. So in his name we ask that you would hold us and hold those whom we love. Hold those that we think of as we pray. Hold those that are far away and round the corner. Hold those in circumstances way beyond our control to impact. But help us to be those who would speak and live and be the hands and feet of Christ in situations where we can make a difference by the power of the Holy Spirit. We lift our prayers to you for this world, for your church, and for all the things that lie in our hearts just now. And we take just a moment to be still and to lift to you our own and private prayers. Lord God Almighty, thank you that you stooped down to us in Jesus to hear our prayers and we present them boldly to you in and through his mighty work. Amen. Before we spend a little time with God's word, we're going to sing once again this time with 571, Take Up Your Cross, number 500. And seventy one. <laughs>
One of the most profound occurrences in the stories of the Gospels is when Peter comes before Jesus and Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter is prompted to look into his own heart and answer that question. Who does he say that Jesus is? And not that long ago as we moved towards Easter, we thought about that and we thought about looking into our own hearts and asking that same question. Who do we say Jesus is? A lot, of course, that had come round to that discussion taking place was what everybody was saying about Jesus. Everybody was talking about Jesus. Jesus was doing this, he was doing that, he was making these things happen, and everybody was talking about this Jesus and what he was like. Paul, in his letter to the church in Corinth, is dealing with a similar situation, responding to what people are saying he is like. Paul, who's Paul? Well, Paul was one of the people that started the church here in Corinth. What's he like? Oh, well, you know, when he comes, he's really timid and he wouldn't say anything to you. But when he writes letters, boy, you see a wholly different side of his personality. People talk about what people are like. And when we come to the story of Balak and Balaam, we have a really interesting opportunity to explore that strange idea of people talking about what people are like. You see, if we were to read just what we read this morning from Numbers chapter 22, just that first section, we would probably say that Balaam was someone who kind of stood his ground. These people came and said, we want you to come, we'll give you loads of money for you to do this thing. And he said, no, no, I have to go and I have to see what God says first. And God told me not to go, so I'm not going. If you give me all the money, all the palaces, all the authority, I still can't come because God told me not to. And we would say, good on you, Balaam, you stood your ground and you did the right thing. But as the story continues, Balaam becomes a much more complex and difficult character to put in a box. To the extent that when the story is over, and we'll get there next month, we'll begin to see that the scriptures do not have a good thing to say about this guy called Balaam. They look back on his legacy as not a positive one, but as one where actually a lot of destruction and challenge and difficulty was brought to the kingdom of Israel. And I wonder if you get a chance this afternoon as you're sitting having a cup of tea, you might have a look through and see all the places where Balaam is mentioned. And as you do that, you'll see, as I said, that he is not held in high esteem. And the reason for that is because as this story of his life, this particular part of his life continues, we see that that obedience to God that so shaped his character in our initial meeting begins to drift away. So at first we see Balaam and we say, what's he like? Balaam, he's that one who's really obedient to God. Let's be like Balaam. But by the end of the story, we ought to be saying to ourselves, let's be nothing like what this man has become. The whole thrust of this idea is who is calling the shots in our lives when we are honest with ourselves. We look into our hearts and say, who do we say Jesus is? We may say from the depth of our hearts, yes, Jesus is he, the son of God who came and who died and who rose again to glory. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the Messiah. We might know that that is the identity of Jesus. But the next question is, who's calling the shots in our lives? Because for Balaam, it started off as if God was calling the shots. He was Call to an obedience that he held on to. But by the end of the story, it wasn't God that was calling the shots in his life. It was his love of money and reputation and authority and power and all of the things that ought not to shape him and fashion him had become the very things that were more important to him than anything else. And there is a danger for us, is there not, to say with our heads, yes, that's who Jesus is, no problem. But our hearts don't beat for him. Our hearts beat for other things. And those things that look so attractive and so worthwhile, all the things that the world can give us, actually can be the very things that call the shots. We don't have control over them. They have control over us. 
Jesus came to release us from the shackles, not only of our sin, but of the world and our desire for the world. Is it wrong to want nice things and to enjoy the fruits of the world? No, it isn't. But if our longing for those things takes control, then why would we just exchange one pair of chains for another? That's why uh, Richard Rohr, when he writes about following Jesus, says this interesting thing. Worship of Jesus is rather harmless and risk-free, but actually following Jesus changes everything. And when we are confronted with Balaam today and what he was and what he became, we are challenged to see the distinction between worshiping Jesus full stop and following Jesus dot, dot, dot. Because so many people in this part of the world and in the church, in the state that we find it in, in our neck of the woods, worship Jesus full stop. They don't follow him, dot, dot, dot. That's why when we are confronted today with the Mr. Men books and the Little Miss books, they are known by what they are. And I wonder what people would say of us, of me, of you, as we seek to live out our lives in this world today. Would they say of us that we are people who don't always get it right, but strive after Jesus? Would they say that we're people who, yeah, make mistakes, but we strive after Jesus? We serve and follow Jesus and we try our best in that endeavor, asking for his strength and his power each day to do it a little better and to focus a little more and to grow a little higher and to have a wee bit more courage. When the darkness of dismay comes, endure it till it's over because out of it will come that following of Jesus which is an unspeakable joy. Those words were written by Oswald Chambers when he found himself in a particularly difficult and dark situation in his life. And he began to see that by holding on to Jesus, there was something that was greater than all that the world could offer, and even something that was greater than the darkness or the struggle that he faced. And that gave him a freedom that he had never really experienced before. Because it wasn't that the things that he faced were unimportant. It wasn't that the challenges that he knew in his life were not difficult. It wasn't that grief or mourning or loss or the, the darkness of the world was any less to bear. It didn't mean that the things that he struggled with and the, 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 the sins in his life were not potent. But what it meant for him was when he looked to Jesus, really looked to Jesus, he saw that in comparison, they were dwarfed before him. That in comparison to the cross, those sins and those things that seemed so big and consuming were dwarfed before it. That compared to he who hung upon the cross, those things were small and that gave him a joy. I've often talked about joy from the pulpit, that joy is not this feeling of happiness, but joy is an understanding, a sense in your heart that no matter what the world is like around you, God is with you. Does that not call us to an obedience? To realize that our reputation and that our place before God and our righteousness and all of that is not because we work hard to achieve it. That is vested in Christ. We have our righteousness in him. So we don't work and toil to make ourselves right with God. We work and toil because in the name of Jesus, we are right with God. Does that not fill our heart with a desire to hold on to he who is holding on to us? And to not be the Balaam who starts so high to fall so low, but to be the Balaam who carries on through. Yes, there's trip hazards in the way, 
That's why Jesus is a shepherd, because he'll lead and he'll guide us through those times of darkness where we'll make mistakes and where we'll falter. But the heart's desire should be one that says, I know who Jesus is, and I am following him. There's a lovely hymn that speaks of this. All for Jesus, all for Jesus. All my being's ransomed powers, all my thoughts and words and doings, all my days and all my hours. Let my hands perform his bidding. Let my feet run in his ways. Let my eyes see Jesus only. Let my lips speak forth his praise. Worldly prize and their gems of beauty cling to gilded toys of dust. Boast of wealth and fame and pleasure. Only Jesus will I trust. Since my eyes are fixed on Jesus, I've lost sight of all beside. So enchained my spirit's vision looking at the crucified. Oh, what wonder, how amazing. Jesus, glorious King of Kings. He's the one that calls us together to be his people every day. That is the call of us today. And as we will move through this story of Balak and Balaam, we see very briefly the beginnings of it here today. That as the Israelites move through, almost at the promised land, 40 years in the wilderness, almost completed, they're on the cusp of crossing the Jordan, but Moab is in the way, the kingdom of Moab. And the king of Moab is in fear of this mass of people that are going to come across through his country into the promised land. And he calls upon Balaam to come and to curse them. This man who is known as a prophet. But he can't come and curse them because God says no. But yet after a bit of a negotiation, he tells him to go. But to do only what God would tell him to do. I wonder as we move through the story, uh, will we see more and more of this person and the person that he becomes through this journey? And would we use that as an opportunity to look into our own hearts and into our own lives and to answer those two questions again every day if it's necessary? Who do you say Jesus is? And are you following that Jesus? Are you worship, full stop? Or are you serving, dot, dot, dot? That's a challenge for all of us. It's a challenge for us to see that the chains of our sin and the chains of the world do not need to be that which holds us back. But by taking them to the cross and by genuinely answering those two questions and looking to Jesus for help, we can see how big he truly is and how amazing his grace that he offers. Actually, truly and beautifully transforms those who come to call upon him. So as I finish today at the start, as I finish at the start of this little story, the message has to be hold on and keep going to him who holds on to us and gives us the power to keep going, to serve dot, 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 as those who know Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior, as those who long and delight and being obedient to. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your scriptures. Many stories that are within and how in even in the most peculiar stories or unfamiliar stories we meet and interact with people who help us to understand what it means to meet and interact with you. Help us as the summer here approaches, we find ourselves in a, a different kind of season. Maybe we have more time to think and reflect. Allow us to do that. And lead us and guide us to be those people who would long to use our time to grow in our faith and in our knowledge of Christ 
and in our service of him. We pray for those whom we know and love, who don't know the Lord Jesus. And we pray that perhaps through our service, we may show him to them and be known by them and by others as those people who follow the Lord. We pray in his name and for his glory. Amen. May we pray. Father, we present this offering to you with hearts that desire to see your kingdom built here and far away. We present this offering to you as those who wish to serve and follow in the work of that kingdom and to be blessed more and more by the joy and grace that are its bricks. So, Father, as we stand together, we pray that we would serve together, love together, love that Son who loved us enough to bear our sin upon the cross. And in his name, we seek the grace that is found in him. We seek your love, which is steadfast and eternal. And we seek the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, that we would bask in that now and indeed forevermore.